So here's what we're going to do tonight. Um, the goal here is really to sort of pull back the curtain a little bit and, and talk about the entire journey, right? Not just this specific campaign and the campaign debrief, but let's get a little bit into the, the, the ups and the downs and the whys um, of, of this. And, and to get started, I actually want to go back a little bit before this most recent campaign. And, um, to your time in, in Arkansas. Um, you'd run for office uh, unsuccessfully, got elected lieutenant governor when the other uh, politician from Hope, Arkansas, who'd spent a little bit of time on this campus, Bill Clinton was elected. Um, you got, you, you um, got involved there and um, eventually was uh, ascended to the governorship in what was then the most democratic state in the country. So I guess I want to start with, you know, what's it like being a Republican governor in a deeply blue state? Well, Mo, first of all, I'm glad we're going to talk about some of those campaigns because uh, the most recent one is not the most uh, <laughs> pleasurable one that I have to talk about. <laughs> so I'm really glad we're talking about some successful ones from the past. Uh, and, and let me say thanks to all of you. I realize nobody has to be here tonight, and I'm mindful of the fact that you are here on your own volition. Frankly, I think you all ought to get uh, extra credit in whatever class of your choice. <laughs> if I were running Georgetown, that's what would happen, but I'm not, so I can't make that happen for you. But I'm, I'm grateful that you've come. And I hope we have a terrific exchange, and I know you're going to get a chance to pepper me with questions, and I look forward to that. I truly do. Such a beautiful campus. It's an extraordinary place, and the history here is just amazing. So I consider it an incredible honor to be here on this campus with you, and I'm especially glad that you filled up the seats because when they told me that I was going to be at Georgetown, I thought, okay, uh, all the conservative students at Georgetown will be there, be at a small table at the Waffle House. Uh, <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't be crowded. So this is terrific. Um, to address the question, it was a tough environment to be only the fourth Republican elected in 150 years to a statewide office in Arkansas. And when I became lieutenant governor, the mix in the uh, House was 89 Democrats to 11 Republicans. In the Senate, it was uh, 31 Democrats to four Republicans, which was more lopsided than any state in the country, more than Massachusetts, Vermont, Oregon, Maine. No state in the country had more Democrats, fewer Republicans than Arkansas, which is not what most people perceive because they just assume that all of the states in the South had of kind of drifted toward being uh, reliably Republican. So being a in that environment, I know what it's like to be on the endangered species list. And it can be very, very difficult. In fact, when I was elected Lieutenant Governor, um, my door, the door to my office at the Capitol was nailed shut. And that was sort of my welcome. I keep you from being elected, but here you go, pal. Webb Hubble uh, admitted to John Fund of the Wall Street Journal at the time that he had ordered it. Now, Webb was working at the White House for the Clintons at that time, and he called back to Bill McEwen, the Secretary of State, and said, you know, fix this guy. So they did. Now, I, I don't hold any bitterness about it. Both of them went to prison. I didn't. There you go. <laughs> Not for nailing the door shut, but for other things. Um, but I, I just want to understand, it was a very vicious environment and all the furniture was taken out of the office. My office stayed now shut, by the way, for 59 days, 59 days. I worked off a makeshift table in a former vault until finally there was enough public pressure that that was changed. But it was not a welcoming, friendly environment. So I'm used to some of the harshest kind of political shenanigans that people have experienced. And quite frankly, it was the best thing that ever could have happened to me made me a better public servant, gave me a much better understanding of what it feels like to, to sort of be shunned and shut out. And in the long term, politically, it was the best thing that could have happened to me because as the only Republican in the state capitol, what happened was the, the overreaching attitude that so many of the elected officials had toward me was such a turnoff to the population that I won in a special election by just a handful of votes in 1993. 
I had to run for re-election in 1994 and won in a landslide with the largest number of votes in the history of the state by a Republican, and I think in large measure was because people appreciated that I didn't go and try to tear the door down and you know, I didn't act in the same way to which I was welcomed. And it was frankly beneficial. For those of you who are biblical students, uh, remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. His uh, brothers sold him off into slavery, dumped him into a pit, and later that was the genesis of his being able to save his people. And he made a statement, he said, what you intended for harm turned out for good. My experience has been sometimes the things that we think are the worst things to happen to us can actually turn out to be the best things. So it, it's a matter of uh, waiting until the final story is told. So before you entered public life and politics, you were a minister. You were involved in Christian broadcasting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very different path. Yeah. At what point did sort of you decide to, to go down this road? Uh, I was always involved in student government in high school and uh, in college. My first career was not that of uh, ministry. It was advertising, radio, and television, which a lot of people don't know. I think if you ever hear the narrative of me, and even to this day, I was being interviewed yesterday on a television show. I can't even remember which one it was. And they said, now, Governor Huckabee, as a minister, and I'm thinking, it's been 30 years since I have been. <laughs> but it's, it's this sort of label, which I'm happy to wear, uh, but for 12 years I was a pastor of a church, and uh, I, I honestly think that it was a large part of what compelled me to get into politics. Here, here's what I don't think people understand. They, they assume that if you're a pastor of a church, you really sort of live in this very compartmentalized little world and you're isolated from reality. Frankly, nobody is more steeped in reality than the pastor of a large congregation for this reason. Every social pathology that exists in our culture today is, a, is an experience that the pastor can put a name and a face to. Everything. You want to talk about elderly people who are having to cut their medicine in half because they can't afford to take the full dose? Want to talk about what it's like for a middle-aged couple to have to decide to take the life support off their uh, relative when their uh, life functions have ceased? Or what about parents whose son is killed in a motorcycle accident? Or, or when they're dealing with a 14-year-old girl who's, who's pregnant? Or a drug-addicted 21-year-old son? Um, there, there's nothing that exists in our culture that you don't see up close and personal. You see people at their best, you see them at their worst. You see every aspect of human life in a way nobody else really does. And it was because of, of that school, I, I call it, my, my graduate school of, of humanity, that made me realize that a lot of the people who were dealing with public policy to s supposedly fix problems didn't even understand the nature of the problems they were trying to fix. And as a father with three young children, I finally came to the conclusion that um, some of us need to get out of the stands and get down on the field and get in the game. And that we shouldn't leave it to quote the professional politicians because many of them were so removed and isolated from the realities of everyday life, they no longer understood it. So that really was a part of that compelling force that got me into it. So let's fast forward a little bit. Okay. You're governor, um, you, the third longest serving governor in Arkansas history. Uh, in January of 2007, you announced that you would seek the presidency of the United States. Why? Why? And not just, you know, not just the 30 second pitch, right? Yeah. How, how did you come to that decision? Who did you talk to? Who did you consult? How did you build a campaign? What, was, what were the decision points to making that fairly big jump? Well, I'd been one of the longest serving governors, not only in my state, but in the country. I became increasingly disenchanted with what I saw was a gridlocked Washington. I dealt in the reality of a state in which I went into a very difficult, hostile political environment, but was able to effectively and successfully govern for 10 and a half years, despite the fact that I never had a legislature 
uh, that was favorable. But I never got less than 90% of my legislative package passed. I learned how to govern, quite frankly. I became the chairman of the National Governors Association, elected by my peers. It gave me an opportunity to, uh, uh, to be involved in things at the national level. Uh, I was very involved in innovative health care policy, as we did some things in, in my home state that uh, were, were pretty avant-garde when it comes to changing the paradigm of health care from just one of trying to pay for sick people to actually trying to prevent and cure diseases uh, because, frankly, the way we're doing it now, we'll never be able to, to catch it, never. Um, we rebuilt the roads, reformed the tax system, brought industry in. There, there was a pragmatic side of me that felt like that governing needed to be about solutions, not just about ideology. And let me say, nobody is more ideological than I am. I mean, I, I would venture to say that you'll not find anybody who is more uh, conservatively wired, if you will, I can articulate and defend those positions, but I've always said I don't think Republicans are right all the time. I don't think Democrats are wrong all the time. I just think they're wrong most of the time, you know, not, not all the time. But government is not about getting your way all the time. It's about looking at a problem, accepting the fact that if the voters sent me, they also sent these other people, and I've got to figure out how do you solve the problems you face given the makeup of the people that you're going to have to govern with. Which means that if we really want to understand governing, I think one of the things is to look to some of the greatest political scientists of the last 100 years, the Rolling Stones, the rock band, whose great 1970s anthem said, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> and honestly, if, if people understood that, whether it was in marriage, business, or politics, a lot more would get done. But take us into the room. When did you decide, right? Who did yeah. you, like, how did you decide, this is what I want to do? Well, certainly I talked with my family, my mm -hmm. wife, my children. Um, I talked to people that I'd served with, not only Republicans, but Democrats. Um, clearly, I couldn't have gotten anything done without Democrats. I talked to a lot of the people that I'd served with who had been legislators. Um, I talked to my pastor, you know, my spiritual leader, my, my confidant. Um, I talked to friends who were other governors who knew me both from a professional and personal standpoint. And a lot of it was, you know, I asked myself, why not? You know, why not? Uh, in, in many ways, it was a little intimidating to think that I would ever do something as bold and audacious as run for president. I, I know you don't know my biography, but you've got to understand, I, I grew up dirt poor in South Arkansas. I'm the first male in my entire family lineage that ever graduated from high school, much less went to college. My father never finished high school. His father didn't, and his father, and his father, and his father didn't. Nobody upstream for me had ever finished high school. No one. My mother grew up in a house in the Depression. She was the oldest of seven kids, grew up in a house that didn't have floors, just dirt. No electricity, no plumbing. I mean, I'm a generation away from as abject poverty as you can ever hear described in the United States. So, I mean, it, it was a little intimidating to think that a kid, given my pedigree, my background, not an Ivy League kid, would be so bold as to say, I'm going to run for president of the United States. But I think what I love about America is that this is still a country where a kid like me can do it. I didn't win, but I came in second to McCain in the... Uh, Republican primary when I was outspent 10 to 1 by all my opponents. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I gave it my best shot, not once but twice. You ended up winning the Iowa caucus with 34% of the vote, which at that time was more votes than anyone in the history of the Republican Iowa caucus. Right. That put you in the top tier because you weren't, you didn't enter that race in the top tier. Oh, absolutely not. Um, how did you do that? Talk about that experience. What's it like to walk into a state like Iowa, this kid who, yeah. you know, is the, a kid who grew up one generation away from abject poverty, to walk into a state like Iowa and make the case and come out the winner? How did you do that? Well, Iowa, uh, I think up until this year, was a state where it was all ground game. 
there, there was no substitute for hard work going out to every county. There are 99 counties in Iowa. You go to every one of them and you meet people and you talk to them. And it is a grueling uh, grind of, of doing events with eight or nine people at a time. Maybe it grows to 15, then to 20, and one day you might have a crowd of 100. Uh, but that's how you want it. And you just talked, you answered questions, you did town halls. It was like running for uh, Congress in a rural part of America um, and, and just relentlessly going out there and answering those questions. And that's what did it. I mean, it was a, a strong ground game organization. We didn't have the money. We were terribly outspent. Um, but it was a state where you just couldn't buy it because you went and had $50 million of advertising for your budget. So the narrative coming out of that win was that you won in large part due to strong support from the evangelical community. Um, and that makes sense given your background. Mm -hmm. So one, um, I, I am kind of curious whether or not you agree with that narrative. But number two, um, I, I'd actually like to get into the role of faith in your public life, because it's obviously so central to who you are. So I'm curious if you could just take a couple minutes to talk about how faith has informed, how your faith has informed the way you view politics and political cooperation. And you know, you've openly complained that you know you're not a one-dimensional guy, right? Yeah. That you that that there's more to you than just that part of you. But I'm curious if you would uh, talk a little bit about how it's defined your political life. Well, I, I think the big miss on the part of most of the national press was that they assumed that my victory in Iowa in 2008, and even the success that I had in other states to get to second place was just evangelicals. Truth is, evangelicals are not a monolithic vote in this country. If they were, I would have been the nominee because there were more of them than any other voting bloc in, in the Republican Party. If you go back and look, what you're gonna find is that most of these so-called evangelical leaders supported candidates other than me. They supported Mitt Romney, they supported Fred Thompson, they supported John McCain. The leaders were very, very separated from the attitude of many of their own constituents. Because the leaders said, who has the money, who has the organization, who can win? The rank and file said, who shares my beliefs? Who really articulates my convictions? But my voting block was more um, a voting block of working class people than it was of evangelicals. Now, keep in mind, a lot of working class people are evangelicals. They go to church, you know, they raise their kids with a certain belief system, but these are people that stand on concrete floors every day in factories. These are people who lift heavy things, who sweat in order to get their paycheck. They don't have to have a gym membership to sweat. They don't pay somebody to sweat. They get paid to do the sweating. They're not paying a gym so that they can go and lift something. They lift things every single day. These are the people like my father, uh, you know, who just had to work with his hands and got his hands dirty doing what he did. A lot of those folks are evangelical, but the, the notion that I won because of evangelicals, I think it was more that I was connecting with people who felt like that the political ruling class had left them behind and didn't know who they were. I want to talk about that point. Because you said that one of your biggest frustrations from that 2008 campaign, and, and I want to move yeah. past that campaign, but... Um, oh, it was actually one of the better ones. I <laughs> this one I don't want to talk about a whole lot. So. <laughs> but you said that you were looked down upon by that political class, by the party elites, the people that you've called the, quote, pompous patrician wing yeah. of the party. Uh, and, you, and I'm going to read a quote that you gave. Quote, what bothered me more than anything was the disdain that I experienced from the elites. They treated me like a total hick, a complete, uneducated, unprepared hick. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, you can tell that that's why they love me so much, because I speak <laughs> about them like that. Look, I, I do think that there is a great divide between uh, many people in what I call the ruling class and, and what the ruling class considers to be the great unwashed. But it is the great unwashed of this country that built our bridges and our roads, uh, that built our cars, that built our homes, that lay the brick. And, and I feel like sometimes that, that there's just a, a real sense of not appreciating that that's what made America a great country. Um, my frustration was that I think in part I was not an Ivy League 
uh, person, didn't go to an Ivy League school, so they assumed that I was intellectually lacking uh, from, from those who had the Ivy League education. Frankly, um, I've debated people from Harvard Law, uh, very smart people, but I never felt like that I was somehow underprepared or unable to hold my own intellectually. Uh, but I think that there is, in many cases, this mindset that you have to have a certain pedigree. Where did you go to finishing school? And, and, and what school did you attend? And if you tell them you went to a small Christian liberal arts college in Arkansas, oh, oh, I see, okay. And they just assume that, you know, you probably was, were still coloring in coloring books in your senior year of college. <laughs> And so I've had to live with that perception. Uh, I mean, I, I, I still to this day bristle at that. And uh, I think America is a country where people come from all different backgrounds and walks of life. And, and frankly, those of us who had to struggle to get where we are, uh, I think we bring something to the table that is important. And we didn't have it handed to us. There was no trust fund. Uh, I worked 40 hours a week when I went to college. Nobody was there to pay for it. My parents couldn't afford it. And, and again, I'm the first male in my family to do it, so I, I'm, I'm working 40 hours a week, carrying 20 hours a semester. I got through college in two years and three months, got my BA, graduated magna cum laude. It wasn't because I was smarter than everybody else. I didn't have enough money to afford four years. So I was figuring if I can you know, get through sooner, um, I can save a lot of money. And, and so rather than it being something that I was ashamed of, it was something that I was grateful for because it taught me how to work, how to manage my time, how to be diligent, how not to expect that somebody's gonna fill in my gaps for me, that I would have to just uh, maybe outperform people around me. And I think it made me a better person. I don't think it made me a lesser person. I, I don't know if that answered the question or not. Hopefully it Close is. enough. Okay. Close, um, enough. Close enough for government work, that's as we right. always say. Yeah. Um, all right, let's fast forward. You came in second place. Yeah. Um, uh, winning seven states. You, um, let's fast forward to four years later, right? 2012. Mm -hmm. um, in the run up, you'd been leading in all the polls. Almost every poll had you in the top two spots for not just the Republican nomination, but in 2009 and 2010, there were a lot of polls that had you beating President Obama head to head. Uh, then in 2011, you decided not to run. And you said, all the factors say go, but my heart says no. We talked about the decision to run. What about the decision not to run when it looks fairly promising? It was equally hard. Um, there were a lot of people who were encouraging me. But I, I also did not feel that it was going to be as easy to defeat an incumbent president as a lot of the Republicans thought it was. Turned out I was quite right. Um, would it have been differently if, if I had run? I don't know. I, I, I really don't. But I, there was something just deep inside of me that just did not give me that sense of peace and sense of, of calling that I think a person needs to endeavor. Uh, to run for president. So, um, you know, I've never regretted it. Even when people said, you would have won if you'd have run in 2012. You'd have been the nominee. You'd have won, too. Well, that's fine. I mean, we can speculate all day. We don't know what would have happened because it didn't happen. But I've never second-guessed it. I've never regretted it. The decision I made was one of the heart, not the head. And I've always found that my heart decisions are usually better than my head decisions. So you're on Fox News. You've got a contract. You're doing well. <laughs> and this election yeah. comes along. What was it about this election that compelled you in a way that 2012 didn't? A greater sense of frustration than I had had before that the Republican ruling class was increasingly disconnected from the reality of what was happening to most Americans. It was very obvious to me that there was such an axis of power that had been formed between Wall Street and Washington and I'll be honest, I, I don't think it matters a whole lot whether Democrats or Republicans in power. Things don't change a lot uh, for middle America because the same donors who fuel the Democrats fuel the Republicans. And, and for those of you who are government students, I'll give you three words that I urge you never to forget. If you want to understand not only government, but understand candidates and what they're likely to do when they get elected, 
forget their speeches, forget their well-rehearsed, structured lines in a debate. Three words that will give you everything you need to know about how they will lead. Follow the money. Look at where their money comes from. See who gave them the money to run with, and you will have a very good indication of what they're going to do when they get elected. I don't care what they say. Their ads may be compelling, but if they're funded by the same corporate globalist interest that are going to be very protective of the oligarchy, then it's not going to change. And I, I don't say that as a matter, it's, it's not class warfare. It's the fact that my frustration is that there is a reason that six of the ten wealthiest counties in America surround where you are right now. Six of the ten wealthiest counties in all the United States surround where you live in Washington, D.C., in the Beltway. Now think about that. What, what, what is, what's made in Washington? It's not like the iPhone is made here, <laughs> right? What, what happens in this town? Government. Nothing else that I know of is really manufactured. Big corporations have lobbyists here, so K Street is, is doing well. This is the most recession-proof town in America. When the real estate market was collapsing in Florida, California, Arizona, and Nevada, it was still doing okay. Houses were still going in appreciation. When there were five million foreclosures going on in the rest of the country and people were losing not just their home, but think about they're losing their pride, their dignity. Because I don't think if people understand that if, you, if you've been foreclosed on, it's not just that you're going to, no one moves into a larger house or a nicer house when they have a foreclosure. They, they go down, not up. And that's not how we're wired as Americans. But the loss of dignity and self-respect is devastating to people. And while that was happening, people in this area were seeing appreciated values. My point in all that is that I became more convinced that there has to be a way to, you, you have to shake up and break up this incestuous relationship between hedge fund, big bank, big corporations, too big to fail, that whole mindset, and the ruling class. And, you know, it was a noble idea that didn't work out as well as I had hoped it would. So. What was different when you stepped back out on the field? I mean, eight years is, a, is an eternity, yeah, right? Yeah, it I is. Mean, and, and the mood of the electorate was different. I'd love Very to touch different. on that. But just also the mechanics of campaigning. Citizens United didn't exist last time, right? Super yeah. PACs didn't exist. Twitter didn't exist. Like, I, I, the, the, how did you adapt? Uh, th there's several things that are different. We, you mentioned the Super PACs. That was very different from eight years ago. Because eight years ago, if you were a candidate, the money came to you and your campaign. You had to at least stand up for your message and be held accountable for it. Now, a candidate really is divorced from a lot of the messaging which is not even healthy to the candidate. It's, it's a terrible development in, in the political realm because it means that campaigns often are sucking air for money and your super PAC has money, but you can't direct them to spend it in a way that would really help you. You can't staff with it, you can't travel with it, you can't advertise with it. Um, it it's an absurd system. It absolutely is sick. Second thing that is different is that the power of 24-hour cable news cycles. I can't tell you enough how that has a big impact because I'll give you an idea. In, in a two week period, August 24th through September the 4th of last year, um, it was an analysis done, <clears throat> CNN, prime time. I'm looking at SC when I say that, not that she was personally responsible. Yeah, for thanks this. a lot, SC. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but in that period of time, Donald Trump got 568 minutes of airtime in a two week period. I got 17 seconds. 17 seconds versus 568 minutes. Now, a lot of us as candidates were finding that if we did get on, I wasn't being asked, Governor Huckabee, you did a lot to deal with the infrastructure of your state, putting your state through an enormous construction program of the roads. Would you talk about the infrastructure of America and what needs to be done? I never got that question. Here's what I'd get asked. Governor Huckabee, yesterday Donald Trump said something about Scott Walker that was really interesting. Would you like to comment on it? 
No, I really wouldn't, because honestly, <laughs> I don't care what Donald Trump said about Scott Walker or Jeb Bush or anybody else. I'd like to tell you what I think's wrong with America and how to fix it, but I don't get to ask the questions, and I just have to answer the ones I get. And frankly, if you don't answer the questions about the controversy, you don't get on. You get on the debate stage, the, uh, the Reagan Library, no, it was the CNBC debate, uh, which was, I think, generally believed to be one of the worst that was held in the Republican primary so far. Um, I got three questions in a two hour, 20 minute period, three. The next candidate from that got nine questions. Now folks, it's really hard. People say, well, how come you didn't break out? How are you gonna break out when you don't get any questions? And by the way, one of the questions I got was, would I like to comment on whether Donald Trump had enough character to be president? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was that kind of ridiculous question. And that's a manipulation of the process, unfortunately. And then I do think the third thing that has changed is that the voters this year are not just angry. They are in a seething rage. Let me tell you what I, I would suggest you, you realize. We are in the midst of a revolution. It is a political revolution. Fortunately for us, it is a bloodless revolution. It could be a coup d'etat with real bullets, but instead it is a revolution of democracy with ballots. But it's an overthrow of the government. It's a total repudiation, and in some ways a retaliation of a government that has been utterly blind to, I think, what's happened to people out there in the rest of the country. It really strikes me to hear you say that, because, and I mean, this with all due respect, yeah. you sound like Bernie Sanders, well, right? I mean, yeah. and then, I mean, and that tells me something. That tells me that this isn't ideological, no, what you're not. talking about, no. right? Well, here's what I, I, I was saying this to, uh, to Jeff, uh, who was the guy who picked me up tonight very graciously. He's over there. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> and we were talking about this, and here's what I said to him. I said, you know, I believe that what Bernie Sanders would say about what's wrong with America is not all that different from what I would say is wrong with America. We've diagnosed the disease pretty much the same way. Now, I would like to think that my approach to treating this illness is really more the approach of, of a neurosurgeon. His is a witch doctor. Um, I would practice true political medicine, and I think he would practice witchcraft, because the idea of giving people a bunch of free stuff and running up another 15, 20 trillion dollars debt on top of the 20 we have, I mean, I, and taxing people 90%, which destroys any, any incentive whatsoever for ever working again, uh, I, I disagree with his prescriptions, but I don't disagree with his diagnosis. The system is rigged, and I, and I hate to be so blunt, but it is rigged. And if you don't think it is, then go into business and don't have the lobbyists protecting you and running interference for you. Watch what happens when you're a community bank versus city bank. Watch what happens when you see your little investment firm in small town America have to live with the same regulations, in fact, more punitive regulations than Goldman Sachs experiences. And, and that's why, look, what I just said, it's one of the reasons that I'm uh, not exactly beloved by the Republican establishment. I, I hope you can kind of read through the lines and get that, but, but I don't care. I think we've gotta be honest and, and diagnose the problem correctly. And what happens is people get bought off in the political system. By the way, let me say this, There's only, one of the reasons Trump is doing so well is because he's one of the few candidates that is not corporately funded. And what scares the people in this town most about him is not that he might lose. You know, they say, oh, well, he, if, if we nominate him, he'll lose the election. No, that's not what they're afraid of. They're more afraid that he will win. And they won't have the influence that they have when typically a person gets elected because they've given so many contributions, they know they've got access, and they know they're probably going to be protected. How many of you have ever seen the Godfather movies? Surely you have, right? Two of the greatest movies ever. If you haven't, you've got to watch those. I know they're old, but they have, they're timeless. And, and if you know anything about the mob, the way they worked was you paid them tribute and they protected you. 
And as long as you paid them the tribute, they took care of you. Your stores didn't get robbed, they didn't get burned, uh, people didn't pilfer, and uh, you know, you were protected, but you paid for it. Folks, our political system runs very similar in that if you pay tribute to the politicians, they will protect you. They'll take care of you. And if you don't, they will punish you and burn your house down, figuratively speaking. <laughs> let, me do, let me throw that in there. I'm not trying to be cynical, and I'm not bitter about it. I, I'm angry as an American that this is not how our system was designed to work. And when I walked out on the steps of, I can't remember the name of the building out here, where George Washington spoke and Abraham Lincoln spoke and you know, many presidents through the history of this country have spoken, I promise you that this was not what those guys intended for our government to be like. This is not about Democrats and Republicans. This is about your country. And if you're a Democrat, rise up and fight it. If you're a Republican, rise up and fight it. Because if you don't, we're going to lose this great republic. Not to the ideology of one of the two parties, but to the common enemy of the people, which is that the game is rigged in favor of those who have required tribute for their protection, which means that the people who don't pay the tribute are the unprotected. Read Peggy Noonan's column from last Saturday in the Wall Street Journal. And even if you're a hardcore Democrat and don't like the Wall Street Journal or Peggy Noonan, I urge you to read it and you'll have the best insight onto what this election is about, why Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are doing well. And our basic ass assessment was that this is about those who are the protected class versus those who are the unprotected class. And the protected class are totally oblivious to why people are so upset. I want to ask a couple more questions before we uh, <coughs> open it up to the students. Um, so I'm going to fast forward. Okay. a little bit and we've um, you uh, Iowa doesn't go as well as it did last time for you that's and, an understatement yeah. um, <laughs> and you get out yep. of the race right uh, in a tweet uh, no actually I did it on on stage did you yeah the tweet I think somebody in my staff sent it out as I was walking Got out it. to the stage okay, okay. Was, anyway so you get up that night yeah and um, the next day you fly home to Arkansas, mm -hmm. and there's stories that have been told and written, and you can tell us if they're not true. Uh, Donald Trump calls you and says, I'm coming to Arkansas. Would love to, uh, for you to come join me. I'm going to do a rally. Would love for you to come join me. You don't necessarily have to endorse me, but let's just talk about the issues we both care about. And you almost did, but your staff talked you out of it. No, that's totally not true. Okay. First of all, I, I didn't go to Arkansas. I went to Florida. My wife and I moved there about five years ago on the Gulf Coast. We still have a home in Arkansas. Our kids uh, live there still, two of our kids. Um, but there was never, uh, he never invited me uh, okay. to come. Uh, there was never any presumption that I would go. I made it very clear that I had no intentions to endorse anybody in the primary, certainly not immediately. Here's what I said, which was true. I don't find it necessary or desirable to endorse anyone right now. All these people in the race, most all of them, a couple of exceptions, most all of them are friends of mine. I've known most of them for a long time. The others that I didn't know before the race, I got to know. And I don't necessarily want to pick one over the other right now. And I think the voters will make that decision, not me. And that, you know, I needed some time. I was still a little raw from the process of giving one year of my life uh, to the gruel of a campaign, and I was in no desire to go out and endorse somebody. And uh, so I, I never, never even got close to thinking I was going to go endorse anybody. And I said I reserve the right to do it later, but I'm not going to do it right now. And I went home. And that's exactly what I did. Went home to see my dogs. I, I missed them. And, I, and they acted like they missed me, which was really, really <laughs> special. I appreciated that. Um. And you still haven't endorsed anyone? No, I have not. You, you want to change that tonight? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got to ask. <laughs> I, am, I endorse the Georgetown Institute of Politics. I I'll love endorse that. that. Uh, we so can there all you get go. behind that. Yeah. Uh, okay, but let's talk a little bit about the field and where the race is going. Okay. Um, Donald Trump had a pretty good night last night. I think it's hard to, That's right. to um, 
uh, to disagree with that, winning your home state of Arkansas. Did you vote for him? I had to, uh, I, had to ask. I, I, I vote in Florida now, so I'll okay. vote in two weeks. Um, um, he continues to be Donald Trump. He continues to make news. He continues to say things that your traditional political candidate doesn't say. He has been in the news uh, on race over the past few days, just the most recent example of, of a Donald Trump flare up. Mm -hmm. um, you're one of the few people that actually went out there and defended him a little bit. Um, now, it was, it's interesting to me, and I'm going to try not to let my 20 years as a Democratic operative uh, color this too much. Oh, but you can't help it. Go ahead. You're right. I can't. <laughs> um, it's, but it was interesting to me because I will say this as a yeah. former Democratic operative. You're a Republican governor from the South who's actually well-respected for having helped break down some racial barriers in right. Arkansas. Right. You made that a central part of your time as governor. You're out there over the past few days defending Donald Trump's um, missteps or not on the KKK and David Duke. And I think a lot of people kind of looked at that and, and we're having trouble reconciling that. Maybe you can help us. Sure. Well, well first of all, let's go back on Friday before this um, exchange with Jake Tapper on Sunday. He was asked and he very clearly disavowed any connection or any uh, acceptance and in fact I think the question was uh, do you accept his endorsement he said I disavow bluntly clearly no equivocation no qualification now just a, a hint of a background you alluded to it I got 48 percent of the african-american vote in my state when I was reelected governor you will not find a Republican in America who got anywhere close to that as a Republican no one white or black as a candidate, just hadn't happened. So I, I come at this from a person who has had extraordinarily strong relationships in the African American community, highest level of votes in that community. When I ran for re-election, I had African American Democratic state senators doing radio spots for me and walking neighborhoods with me. Uh, so I, I'm only telling you that because Anyone who says, well, you know, Huckabee might be sort of a closet, uh, old-time Southern racist, <laughs> it's laughable. I stood in the front of an all-white church as a 25-year-old pastor and received the first African-American member and said that if he's not welcome here, I leave with him. And I had people that got up and walked out, best thing that ever happened to that church. Uh, I had death threats. I had people who said that they would see to it that the church finances dried up. The next month the church had the best uh, financial contributions that it had had in its 100 year history and it broke a barrier and it just was different from that point forward. So I don't have to prove to anybody my bona fides when it comes to uh, just being absolutely disgusted at any form of racism. But I felt that this whole thing with Trump, and look, Trump says a lot of things I can't defend, but this was ridiculous because he had disavowed it on Friday. I don't know what he heard in his earpiece. I do know from being on television a lot and wearing an IFB that sometimes you don't hear as well. And frankly, at my age and at his, you don't hear well even if it isn't an earpiece. <laughs> Years of loud rock and roll do not work to your hearing, so let that be a, a warning, though I didn't pay any more attention to my parents than you did yours. Now, let me get to Monday. Repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly, he overwhelmingly disavowed, condemned, I don't know what else he could have done. And I felt like that the news media was creating a story that really wasn't a story. And, and I just thought it was ridiculous how they continued to hammer this as if it's a story. Here, one of four things happened. A, Donald Trump is a racist. Though nobody can show any sign in a man's 69 years of life that he's ever done things that were racist. I mean, you just don't see the bigotry there. You don't. But that's one option. Option number two, um, he's really, really dumb. He's just a very stupid man. <laughs> you don't build a company he built. You don't get where he is being that dumb. You don't get through Wharton School of Business being that dumb, quite frankly. So that's, that's an option, option three. Option three is that he really didn't hear 
uh, what Jake Tapper said, and by not hearing it, I heard, well, he repeated back. Well, he repeated part of it back, but maybe he didn't fully grasp the, the full nature of the question, and he may have said, I've already repudiated it. I don't know. That's the third option. Fourth option, he's really, really smart, and at the time when Marco Rubio was out there beating the heck out of him and talking about his tan and his hands and all sorts of, and, you know, wetting his pants and all sorts of stuff, Donald Trump totally changed the narrative, and everybody's talking about Donald Trump again, and nobody's listening to Marco Rubio, and he, and he totally owned the news cycle, even though to most people it was negative. The fact is, his strong supporters never believed for a moment that he was a racist or a bigot. All right, let me, uh, we, we can litigate if, if okay. we wanted to, whether or not he, what he heard and whether, what he repeated back. But, and I think there are a lot of people out there who wonder if he wasn't being a little too cute by half there. Could right? be. If he was just kind of sending a few dog whistles to some people. But and who then would he have been sending those to? But, but let me... Well, but let no, me, but, but let me ask this. Who would those dog whistles have been sent to? I mean, I grew up in the Deep South. I, I lived through Jim Crow laws in the 50s and 60s. I'm telling you, the South is not this hot bed of racism that people think it is. I find that there's more prejudice and bigotry when I go to places in the north and when I go to places in the south. It's just, I, I mean, I, I just don't know what people are, are but, pretending but there is happening. I think there's there. a bigger issue here. And I think it's incredibly important for this room. Let me just do a quick survey, okay. if I may. Are there, if you're a Donald Trump supporter, please raise your hand. Okay, so there's a couple, right? I think they are uh, obviously in the minority and in, in, in this generation specifically. You know, KKK, Muslim bans, anti-marriage uh, equality, anti-immigrant. This is, wh wherever you are on the policy, this is the face of the Republican Party that is emerging today. And I think it's amplified under Donald Trump. And I guess my question is, what do you say to everyone in this room, except for the three people who raised their hands, <laughs> to help them get past that, to help them understand what it is you see in the Republican Party that compels you and people like SE to, to believe in this party and its ideology when this is the face that's being presented? Well, for me, it's pretty simple. When there is true conservatism, everybody benefits by it because it's based on the idea of free enterprise, that there's a meritocracy in our society that you are able to rise above your circumstances, that where you start is not where you have to stop, that you're not stuck where you, are, where you start, and that an economy works for everybody from the top to the bottom, and that you can work your way from the bottom up through the middle to the top. It's not automatic, there's no guarantees, but the opportunity is there, and, and you're not going to be uh, guaranteed your place because of some uh, government quota, but you're not going to be denied your place because of government punishing you for working hard. Um, I, I think that's a, a large part of it. There's going to be a sense of freedom. There will be a, a focus upon individual responsibility rather than groupthink. America, I believe, was made great because people were treated as individuals with their individual ideas and thoughts and passions and dreams and hopes rather than they had to be a part of a group and only as the group rose could they rise. If the group fell, they had to fall too. Um, I think that's a, a great message. Unfortunately, that's not the message that a lot of Republicans, again, in the ruling class, have sent forth. If conservatism was doing what it should be doing, our economy would be doing great. Our place in the world would be more secure. Now, some of that you could say, well, that, we'll blame that on Obama and the leadership of the White House. But some of that is because the Republicans have bought in. It was the Republicans who uh, affirmed the Iran policy, uh, the funding of Obamacare. They were the ones who joined in and even led the fight for the trade agreement, which probably cost a lot of Amer or will cost a lot of Americans their jobs. We're in a huge trade deficit of $13 trillion since 1990. Uh, I'm for free trade, but I'm not for a sucker punch trade agreement where it's good for the people who own the companies, but it's not good for the Americans who work for those companies. And so it's not that I'm at all ashamed of the Republican message. I think the Republican message has been hijacked 
uh, by the oligarchy, by the corporatists, the people who look at a global perspective rather than an American perspective, and that's not healthy for, for those that we're supposed to be serving and helping. I'm going to ask one last question, okay. and then we're going to open it up. I'm going to throw out a phrase, and I'd like your instant reaction to that phrase. Okay. Trump Huckabee 2016. <laughs> uh, ask Trump, because <laughs> he, he makes that decision, I don't. I'm not sitting around thinking that that's likely to happen, but um, it's but not But if you mine. got a call, you're not, know, you're not like, ruling it out. Nor am I ruling it in, because it's not, it's not, my, not my call to make. Got to ask. Okay. okay, your turn. Raise your hand and um, tell us who you are and where you're from. And if we have trouble hearing you, we'll repeat the question. And as a reminder, please phrase all comments in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> always listen to Hannah. Yeah. Great question. I'm outraged that people would say those kind of things for this reason. All of us who were presidential candidates on the Republican ticket were asked to essentially guarantee that we would support the nominee of the party. Remember when Do Donald Trump was famously paraded uh, in front of the cameras to sign this pledge that he would support the Republican nominee, that he wouldn't run a third party campaign? Fine. He pledged his allegiance. So did I. And frankly, I don't have any reason not to do that because Look, here's how parties work. Parties provide millions of dollars worth of infrastructure and underpinning so that if you run with a party label, you need to appreciate that there have been thousands and thousands of people who have gone to the committee meetings and have paid their dues, and that's the infrastructure on which you run. So you have a, a sense of, of really obligation, I think, to be loyal to the party and to its nominee. In the Republican Party, last time I checked, we picked our candidate by way of an election, not a selection. It wasn't that a handful of people, party bosses, got together under the big dome and said, okay, here's the guy we're going to pick. It's that we said, ah, oh, this is America. We elect our officials, and so we'll have elections, and everybody gets a vote, and they get to go vote, and we live by the results. When I see these guys say, well, I'm not going to support him, I'll support a uh, third party. Here's my question. If Donald Trump or Mike Huckabee or Jeb Bush or anybody else has to pledge a loyalty to the party, shouldn't the party pledge a loyalty to whoever the candidate is that's selected by the people who actually went out and voted? Because if that's not going to happen, then we don't have a party. Let me, let me flip it a little bit. You've been very, very rough on Ted Cruz. You've openly questioned his character. You willing yep. to submit to that for someone whose character you openly question, submit to supporting him if, if he were to be the nominee? I, I've not questioned so much his character as I have his tactics in the election. But if Ted Cruz is the nominee of our party, then I will vote for him because I said I would. And I believe that, you know, he's, he's not perhaps maybe my number one choice. <laughs> you just want to stop there. <laughs> but if he is the, the person that our party selects among the others, including me, then I will support him because I believe that that would be a better choice than Hillary or Bernie. So yeah, I, I'll absolutely tell you that. Okay. Uh, yeah, over there. Yep. Governor, thank you for being here. My name is Andrew Ward. I'm from the Boston area. I'm a freshman here at Georgetown. Many Saturday nights at 8 o'clock watching you with my grandmother on Fox News. <laughs> um, God bless uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my hometown in Massachusetts voted for Donald Trump 68.5%. In the town of Jason, 73.5%. And I'm about 10 minutes, 15 minutes north of Boston. What do you say to people like my dad who really are independent, you know, he's voted for Democrats, Republicans, and he's been a staunch uh, Trump supporter since the beginning. Um, I'm kind of coming around now that it's inevitable almost. Uh, 
how do you, how does someone like me dig myself out of a hole where my entire room of peers would look at me as someone who's not, uh, who is outrageous for supporting someone like Donald Trump? Maybe my, my follow up to you would be, why are they outraged? What is it that they find so objectionable? And I'm not trying to defend Trump. Everybody thinks, I'm constantly sort of uh, hammered, I think, on a lot of the network news shows as well. He's really a Trump supporter. And by the way, my daughter, uh, who is my campaign manager, she has gone to uh, work for the Trump campaign as a senior advisor, but that doesn't mean I, I mean, she's married and three kids, so she's, she's on her own, she's an adult, she can do what she wants. I'm not, I'm not endorsing, and I'm not even a, you know, trying to say I'm a Trump supporter. I just don't like it when people are beating up on him and they can't really justify it. My question, your friends who say you're crazy for leaning toward him, what do they say? What are the reasons? Uh, I would say his support for traditional values, uh, for, for traditional marriage, and yeah. what he said about immigration, which normal, I would argue, Americans would say that's a crime and most crimes are punished appropriately. Uh, that somehow that you're a racist or a bigot for supporting Donald Trump, who, uh, in my opinion, like you argued, has never demonstrated these tendencies and has just spoken the will of the majority of American people, apparently in you know in the votes that have already been cast. And when my I was never raised in a house that was racist or bigoted or anything, just with strong traditional values and a conservative focus. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, even if Donald Trump doesn't have traditional conservatism, it's better than the opposite uh, wing, which is, you know, far, far different than what we're exposed to. Fair enough. Um, and I, I guess I should repeat some of the traditional values and things like that is, is what, uh, what was said. Look, you're on a, a Catholic campus not that the students necessarily reflect an orthodox Catholic theology, uh, but traditional marriage and a strong respect for the sanctity of life are a very integral part of the theology of the church that this school is a part of. I don't think that that makes a person unacceptable for public office. My gosh, if we have to be so compliant with politically correct views, I've always been amazed that people argue for tolerance and diversity as long as you don't have any. And I mean, those of us who are unapologetically pro-life, pro-traditional marriage, uh, we're looked upon as, as completely unacceptable. Well, I'm not sure if I understand that. I, I recognize not everybody agrees with me. I'm willing to engage in a thoughtful discussion. I don't want to yell and scream about it because I don't see any good coming out of that. But we can have that conversation as long and as intently and as uh, intensely as you want to have. But diversity means that there ought to be room for people like me who believe in traditional marriage. There ought to be room for people like me who believe that every life has value. There's no such thing as a person who's disposable, who's expendable, that there's no such thing as a worthless person, that no person deserves to be uh, considered as is insignificant, that we ought to elevate human life, not, not devalue it, and that the Down syndrome child is just as valuable as the captain of the football team. I, I really believe that. I think the equality of every human life is something that to me is very sacred. You don't have to agree with that, but at least let's have that as a civil, uh, thoughtful conversation. But if that's the reason, then I would say stick with your principles and defend them, articulate them. And sometimes people want to agree with you, but that's okay. In, in America, it's supposed to be okay. You're not supposed to you know, be ostracized, forced out of jobs, because you don't agree with that. Um, yeah, let's go over there. Uh, hi, my name's Tom Dressy, I'm from uh, Potomac, Maryland. Uh, so away from Donald Trump questions here, but just the question thinking, what would a president question is, because I don't know if you can hear it, if I were president, what are the first issues I would have tackled? Uh, one of the things I would have clearly tried to do was to bring people of members of the Congress together 
uh, not on the front pages of the paper, because you, you can't govern this way. One of the reasons that I, I've been very disdainful of President Obama is I feel he was inept and incompetent to understand the role of the executive branch and how to govern and how to lead. To be fair, so you don't think I'm being partisan, Bill Clinton was very good at this. He understood the nature of the job. And that is that you, you can say your, your, your piece, but if you really want to accomplish something, achieve something, you, you don't demonize the other side publicly. You bring them into a room and you listen and you talk and you take the easiest things first. You find common ground, you solve them, you start building trust and it takes time. And I, I just don't think that's how politics has been approached, particularly in Washington. I mean, there are some things that I would certainly do. I'd get rid of the Iranian deal. I would make it very clear that America will once again be true and loyal to its true allies like Israel, uh, that we're not going to uh, uh, put them off to the side as I think we have in the past few years, that America will keep its promises. Um, I would work very hard toward changing the tax system in this country uh, so that we don't punish the people who are trying to work their way up from the bottom through the middle class and, and one day uh, to achieve something. That's why I support a consumption tax as opposed to a tax on income and productivity. I mean, I could get into a long litany of things that I would do, but the most important thing I think I do as president is try to restore some sense of trust, not only from the American people to the government, but within the government to bring prominent Democrats to meetings and build relationships, get to know them, listen to them, and recognize there, there's got to be room for um, the, the idea that we have to govern. You know, you have to get some things done. And uh, it takes time. It's not pleasant. Let me tell you something. As a governor who had to deal with a 90% Democrat legislature, I would rather have spent a lot of evenings watching movies or football as opposed to inviting Democrat legislators over to the governor's mansion for dinner and getting to know their wives and their kids and, and, and building relationships. But if I wanted to rebuild the roads, get the school system where it's functioning and kids were getting a decent education and all the things that we try to tackle, I had to get those guys to, to help me do it. You know, I didn't major in math, but I can count to 50. And if you can count to 50 plus one, you win. If you don't get to that, you lose. I don't care how great your arguments are and how smart you are and where you went to school. It's fundamental, basic math. And you win when you get the votes and you lose when you don't. It's really pretty simple. Politics is not as complicated as some people try to make it. Yeah, right there. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm from Minnesota. Uh, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, my question is, uh, a lot of the press that you did receive uh, in the past year was centered around your support for Kim Davis. Um, and my question for you is, how do you reconcile uh, the rights of an individual, as you said, uh, to stand by his or her convictions uh, with the rights of um, like the LGBT community to marry? Sure, fair question. Uh, Kim Davis was put in jail without bail. Think about this for a moment. And for what did, for what? It wasn't that people couldn't have a marriage in a same-sex relationship, is that she didn't want to put her name on it because the law under which she was elected, and the only law that was in front of her was the Kentucky Constitution that expressly spelled out that marriage was between a man and a woman. She had asked her legislature and the governor prior to the June ruling of the court uh, to create an accommodation for people who did not feel that they could put their name on a marriage certificate of two people of the same gender. They refused to do that. The court decision came and she said, I can't do that, it's a matter of conscience. We have a long history in this country of accommodating people for deeply held religious convictions. I personally visited Gitmo. And for those of you who think that, oh, it's a horrible place. Actually, I took my prison director down there when I was governor. We went away saying, my gosh, I hope none of our inmates ever see this place. They'll all want to be transferred. But here's, here's what I want to tell you about Gitmo. What was amazing to me was the level to which we went to accommodate the religious preferences of the detainees. They were provided prayer rugs five times a day. They could stop whatever they were doing and pray. They were provided halal meals that cost three times what the meals cost of the U.S. servicemen and women 
who actually guarded them and protected them. Um, they were allowed every imaginable accommodation for their religion. And these were people who were terrorists, who had murdered Americans, or plotted to murder Americans, and they were given that. A county clerk in Kentucky is put in jail without bail. Now, Jeffrey Wayne Dahmer got, was allowed bail. John Wayne Gacy uh, was given an amount of bail. Al Capone was given bail. Kim Davis was not. I, I don't understand how anybody can justify that that was a fair uh, treatment of justice to an elected clerk who, by the way, was a Democrat. Wasn't a Republican. I know a lot of people. That never got reported very often because everybody assumed she was a right-wing Republican. She was an elected Democrat. And I just thought that this was a sad day in America when a person is criminalized and put in jail for following their conscience and their convictions and no accommodation was made. Right there. Uh, my name is Hope Edwards and I'm from Nebraska. This question dovetails the, the previous on freedom of conscience. Okay. Um, I'm a government major here at Georgetown, but I'm also a Christ follower going to seminary and Christian ministry, so interested in government and religion. What do you do when um, laws um, or even if the Constitution were to be amended, were to change and you're in office um, and that were to contradict uh, your religious belief as a Christian, what, what would you do? Uh, great question. How do you reconcile if there's a law that you're being asked to follow that violates your conscience? Uh, I think, first of all, if there's a way you can change the law, you, you try to do that. I mean, our laws, one, the genius of our, of our system, and it really is the genius of our system, is that we can change it. Um, if we can't, then we either suffer the consequences for not obeying the law, which is sometimes what we do. The, I, I think the most remarkable thing about Martin Luther King was he never advocated that people overthrow the government. He advocated that people change the government, that if they couldn't, that they were willing to experience the consequences, but do it peacefully. And if you read the letters from, a Birmingham, from the Birmingham jail, they're powerful. Oh my gosh. I mean, it, it's a roadmap, really, for proper civil disobedience. And uh, I think in many ways he set the template for what we do. As those of us who do follow Christ as our, you know, as, as the highest calling of our lives, which, which I would like to believe I do, um, I, I think we try to, to make sure that we understand that sometimes we won't win. We may lose. Um, we, may, we may experience consequences for it, but better the consequences of suffering for what we really believe than selling out. And I go back to this thing Jesus said, better that a, a person, uh, better than a person, uh, if, he gains the, if, a, if a person gains the whole world but loses his soul, what has it profited to him? And I, I really think that that's an important lesson, especially for those of us who get into politics. If we lose an election, but we maintain our dignity, our self-respect, and consistency in our faith, that's better than compromising on a fundamental aspect of our faith and then having some earthly power that's gonna be passed on to somebody else anyway. Um, yeah, right there. Governor Hopi, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Blake Atherton. I study political science and economics. Um, you mentioned that you were outfunded 10 to 1 yeah. uh, in the 2008 campaign cycle, but you still managed to finish second in the primary. Uh, to what extent do you think money actually does influence the outcome of these elections, both at the, on the legislative side and the executive? Do you think there's any need for reform in how, uh, in how money wins elections or fails to in that instance? Great question, and it's about money and elections. Look, there's no perfect way to do this. Um, one thing I would do is to say prohibit nothing, disclose everything. One of the reasons we have the mess we have is because there are very tight restrictions on a campaign and a candidate. There are virtually no restrictions on an independent expenditure. So the dark money, if you call it that, uh, the independent expenditure, the uh, super PACs, can receive unlimited funds. There are ways that you can circumvent even the reporting of where those funds come from. So, you know, gazillionaires can write big checks and, and you never really know that they're the ones who gave the money. And those funds can be used to 
beat the daylights out of somebody or to elevate somebody. The campaign is restricted to a $2,700 maximum contribution. That's the most that a person can give. You can be George Soros or Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, but you can still only give $2,700 to a candidate in a federal election this year. It goes up depending on rates of inflation. Um, you can give a billion dollars in soft money, independent expenditures, and it's really corrupted the system. So I'd say if you want to give a billion dollars to the campaign of the candidate, do it. Disclose it so everybody knows you're a wholly owned subsidiary of the donor, but at least people know who's pulling your string. I think that's a better system than this secret little system we have now that is so phony and so dishonest and disingenuous. And frankly, a lot of us as candidates, we hate it because we don't really get to control the message. I got somebody out there spending money on my behalf, I get blamed for it, but I may hate the message that the super PAC is putting out. I can't even pick up the phone and call them and say, take that stupid thing off the air, because I've just violated a federal law. I could go to prison for making that phone call, which is stupid. I mean, I think most of us, well, that's kind of dumb, isn't it? Yeah, it's real dumb, but that's, that's the law as it is today. We just found some bipartisan agreement here on, on yeah. this point. Um, I know you've got a, a hard stop time, so we've got time for one more. So let's ask right here. Hi, my name is Emily. Um, I'm a government major here in Bunker Fairfield, Connecticut. And I'm curious what your view is on the recent decision by Republican leadership to not even consider um, a Supreme Court nominee, um, given especially your history of working with Democrats, um, but also your support for the Republican Party. Question about uh, the strategy of the Republicans not to consider a Supreme Court nominee. I mean, they could argue that they're simply doing what Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer uh, strongly suggested back when George Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush was president in 1992 in his uh, last year, simply not to, uh, to hear any of the uh, nominations. Um, in a perfect world, you would have people nominated that would be really pure jurist, not ideologues. When you lose someone like Antonin Scalia, who I duck hunted with, by the way, Ouch. great guy, great guy, funny as heck, and a good shot, by the way, I will give him that. Um, but when you lose someone who is a, a true constitutionalist, who believes that you should make court decisions based on what the text actually says and what it was intended to mean at the time it was written, not what we want to reinterpret it to mean, which I think is very, very important. Um, and the likelihood that President Obama would nominate someone who had that same conviction. Look, the president has every right to nominate someone to the Supreme Court. So I would say to the president, that's your constitutional duty and right, do it. But if that's his constitutional duty and right to nominate, it is equally the constitutional duty and right of the Senate uh, to either vote it down, vote the nomination down, or not even to schedule it for a hearing. Now there may be political consequences for that, but it, we, we can't have a system of government that says, well the president has a right to nominate. He sure does. The Senate has a right to not hear it or to vote it down. Both are equal to each other. The branches of the government are equal. Um, and we need to remember that. So. <coughs> Some think the Republicans are taking a big risk. Look, folks, how many of you know anyone who votes for president based on the implications of the Supreme Court? I mean, honestly. A few law students? S.E. <laughs> I might, you know, I mean, but we're not normal. <laughs> we aren't. I mean, a guy, if you saw the video, and I, I thought it was so powerful, the, the video, of when the CEO of the carrier company in Indianapolis went in and announced to 1,400 workers at that plant that their jobs were going to Mexico. One of the saddest pieces of video I've seen in the last year. I mean, it just, it choked me up watching this. These are people who had been working for that company and building equipment and doing it for 20 years, thinking they had a job, they were gonna take care of their kids, and one day a guy walks in, stands up and says, well, um, we're making a tough decision, all of your jobs are going to Mexico. And he fires everybody. And, and the visceral reaction that you saw, my point is, most people are gonna vote for a president based on 
their reaction to that piece of video, not the reaction that they're going to have to a Senate 4 flight fight over whether the procedure of selecting a Supreme Court justice. I think that Supreme Court justice appointment is critically important. I would urge the Republicans, um, I can't imagine anyone Obama would nominate that they're going to want to uh, affirm because I can't imagine that he would have nominated anyone even close to Scalia. I'm not even sure they would nominate anybody close to Kennedy. I, I just can't imagine it. Obama's not had a history of those kind of appointments. Um, but, you know, if he wants to nominate somebody, sure, let him do it. And then let them scrutinize that, that person and decide if they want to vote him down. Governor, I know you need to go. I just want to say, I spent so everyone here knows, 20 years in politics and was the national spokesman for the Democratic Party. There isn't a lot you and I agree on. <laughs> um, and I've put out my fair share of press releases attacking you. I'm sure you years. did. <laughs> um, but it means so much, I think, to myself and to everyone here that we had this dialogue tonight. Because while I'm not going to agree with you, if I don't understand where you're coming from, I'm never going to get even halfway there. Yeah. To, to, and, and, and that's what we need, I think, a lot more of. And so I very, very much appreciate your coming here and sharing some thoughts and, and answering some questions. Sorry. Well, I, I want to say, Mo, thanks to you. And what an incredible group of students. Respectful, uh, insightful, great questions. You know, I, I never know what to expect on a college campus. Sometimes I go and I have people lined up screaming and yelling at me and protesting that I even got to be on the campus. And I'm always thinking, boy, that's, that's tolerance. I love that. Um, they haven't even heard me yet, and they already hate me. Uh, but you know what? That's OK, too. But you guys have been terrific. And, and I hope not so much that I changed your minds if you came here as a uh, committed liberal Democrat, but at least you, I hope, will go away saying, you know, I still think the guy's full of nonsense. Uh, but at least he, he truly knows what he believes and why he believes it. There are a lot of times, I've had some of the best conversations of my life with people that I didn't agree with. I, I don't honestly like having just exclusive conversations with people who agree with me, because there's no traction there. I, I don't learn much, I don't get much out of it. If, if I go and have a conversation with somebody and everything they say, they say, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right. I mean, I walk away with nothing. If I can have a conversation with someone with whom I don't agree, but I better understand where they're coming from, I may still totally disagree with them. But I'm better prepared even to approach that issue the next time than I would have been. And I hope that that's how you feel tonight. But uh, I want to say thanks to S.E. It was uh, S.E. who first approached me about would I be willing to come and uh, be a part of this. And I was delighted to say yes and, and to Mo and everyone here at Georgetown who have been so very accommodating, incredibly gracious. It has been an honor and a pleasure. And I hope all of you uh, well. If you're going to vote, for the Republican, whoever it is, please don't let anything keep you from voting. If you're going to vote for a Democrat, remember the election has been postponed <laughs> until 2017. That's about right. Save the country. That's about I, right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.